So upon reading some of John Jeff's Green Lantern comics, I was kind of blown away by how drastically different the sense of genre is. Green Lantern is less of a superhero and more of a straight up sci-fi character who's more Dan Dare than Superman. As a result, to adapt the character, it's a full package deal. It's not just a hero, but an entire realized mythology composed of realized worlds, political systems, cultures, species, histories. Everyone has a story, so there's an expansive sense of curiosity and grandeur. As a result, I'd argue this is where the live action film fell apart, because despite being a perfectly fine, capable superhero film with a likeable main character, oh my god, how? How did you know it was me? A fairly capable villain, it's palpably underwhelming in the way it visibly retracts itself from an imaginative cosmos to a love triangle on Earth. But hey, you, you're doing great, so. <laughs> I am, I'm doing great. It's like watching porn without any nudity. Not that I would know any of that. Subsequently, to avoid the sense of visible retraction, the Green Lantern animated movies tackle the material in very, very different ways. Therefore, as adaptations, they rise and fall in different ways. Yes, I'm just saying that to justify the title. Something, something, Green Lantern First Flight is, to an extent, what if the live-action film didn't chicken out and fully embraced itself as a sci-fi adventure while still being a superhero origin film, all done through giving you a tour of the cosmos with a buddy cop tail. Howl is chosen and inducted into the core. He's a total rebel that irritates guardians who look down on him, but Sinestro likes humans because of their contempt for authority aligns directly with his own personal disenchantment. Unlike the others, I like humans. I admire their spirit and their natural contempt for authority. It's well founded here. He's up for like total murder and genocide and torture and stuff. But as the Guardian said, The Green Lantern Corps is an ideal, Sinestro. You don't save it by ignoring what it stands for. In contrast, Hal is just a cool dude. He helps a poor worker who has a Hitler mustache and this cute alien baby thing. <laughs> As the protagonist, Hell is both the best thing and the worst thing in the film, because he's genuinely likable and charming as the lead POV. Just tell me you love Ella. But I'm also irrationally irritated by how he's so overly competent with no f training at all. My uncle was a cop. 30 years on the Coast City Police Force, used to let me turn on the siren. Nice guy. Oh right, he used to go on patrols with his uncle. But what the f*** does that have anything to do with knowing how to use electricity to fight invisible aliens? Or even the mental experience needed to use willpower and imagination for the ring? The poser's not even trained. He even takes on and wins against Boudicca without any power. Hell is jarringly perfect and achieves everything from the get-go, which would be fine if this was less of a doing journey and more of a becoming journey, where the conflict is more about him learning about himself and becoming more enlightened, as opposed to slaying a dragon of sorts. But nope. Hell doesn't really have an arc, and the climax is him beating Sinestro in a fist fight, because in a world full of morons who just stand around and get blasted all the time, his newbie ass is already the best. And you thought I was green before. There are beautiful and powerful moments, like when it rains rings from the dead and the overall sense of galactic scale, but Hal never takes anything seriously, so the stakes and the sense of awe is never truly felt, and his cavalier attitude is never truly challenged, so it never feels earned. All I ask for is your loyalty. Now you see, you had me. Right up until that last part. Anyways, not to sound too harsh, First Flight is good, but it just doesn't really have anything to say or is particularly provocative when it comes to its world or its main character. However, not being limited by the main character and having themes is actually exactly what the next film excels at. Emerald Knights is an anthology that explores the values that transcends mortality, race, and time from serving the Green Lantern Corps, the ideal which the Guardians once spoke of. It opens with a poor lantern being insanely violently killed by antimatter before the title plays, and the film is immediately way more beautiful. The darker shadows, the sense of grandeur and the tone, the music, the sense of urgency and dread. Everyone must evacuate Oa, and as that's happening, Various characters tell stories to pass the time. So even though this film uses the same designs from First Flight, it's not a sequel or even a midquel. It is 
technically standalone. Hal is now voiced by Nathan Fillion. <laughs> oh, don't believe everything. Arisha is an established lantern like before, but a new recruit, and Sinestro is extremely polite, even towards the Guardians. Excuse me, Ganthet. But these precautions do seem rather extraordinary. The first story is of the first Lantern, Avra, who during the galaxy's infancy, where war and chaos outbalanced everything else, was a humble squire chosen by the ring to fight armies. But as everyone gets slaughtered and lose hope, Avra was the one who chose to believe in Will. And it's through Will, he forms the first construct, a massive sword, destroying entire armies. The others follow suit, fading through time of the many lanterns, to Abin Sir, to Hal Jordan. This story introduces a sense of awe, a sense of history and wonder to the world. It's immediately made clear Hal isn't the centre of the story, he's one of a long line of a never-ending story. A history long before him, and a future that will be long after him. However, living isn't guaranteed, as the next story explores. When Kilowog was a nervous cadet like Arisha, he had to deal with a tough instructor who threw him in a volcano. The purpose was to show these cadets that their lives are now owned by their service, and he lives up to his words when he ends up critically wounded to protect civilians during an attack. Kilowog, now understanding, adopts his old instructor's demeanor to respect him after he's dead. The key words here are, But getting old in my core is a privilege. We die, so innocents don't. It's that simple. Once you put on the ring, the life you live stops being your own. Which also gives thematic meaning to the amount of death we see. In fact, the instructor writing the lantern symbol with blood on Kilowog's chest is like the perfect symbolic representation of this. Subsequently, this is further developed with Lyra's story. She quite literally had to sacrifice her familial identity for her service. During her homecoming, her family led a genocide and made her home a hostile planet. She fights with them and returns to her old bedroom, left as it was. She then confronts her father, and in a flashback, we also see this poor big-headed fellow getting fucking beaten to death. Jeez, he's genocidal because Lyra called for help when she was chosen, losing her family's honor or something. But she believes in a higher calling now, and her father dies proudly in the end, as honor has been restored or something. It's kind of cliched, but it's really effectively done, and goes to show that even in the vastness of space, I guess we share common questions of, who are we? However, after this familiar tale, the next is about instilling wonder again into the core member themselves. The story of Mogo, which is one where Space Ruddy Piper wanted to fight the greatest warrior ever, which is Mogo. He goes to a planet looking for him, but then it's revealed the planet is Mogo. So right? It's cute, and what Evan's story is poetically themed around destiny. We know he'll die, but how much free will do we have? Abin believes in it. But Sinestro doesn't. Everything we do is a part of that destiny. We will agree to disagree. They save a stranded ship, an example of destiny. But then Atrocitus gives a glimpse of the future where Sinestro kills the core, but Abin refuses to believe it. Sinestro, in the present, is actually the one telling the story with great fondness of his old friend. Maybe in this continuity, Sinestro didn't turn evil. You almost had me, demon. But you took a green lantern down a path his willpower would never let him go. Or maybe this loyalty is exactly what's wrong. The lanterns are blind to themselves. And if the members can be as wondrous and willful as the history and meaning of the core, then this conflict between the two is a scary promise. In the end, Arisha comes up with a plan to defeat the antimatter with Oa. She gets her own story written then. Everyone celebrates, and the diversity and hope for the future generations is what's highlighted. Once again, the diversity of the core has proven to be its greatest asset. Whether it be represented by a planet, or a young woman with the ingenuity to turn one into a weapon. And that was kind of what this film was about. Every story, every character, and every theme explored were cogs of a deeper celebration. One where Green Lantern isn't about a single man's story, but a universe filled with millions of stories, like the cells of a being, keeping it alive. Wait for me, just take a look around you. Can't you see? What's the appeal of being poetic when you can be edgy? The Ranian scum have murdered the Thanagari and sent to destroy them. Mm -hmm. You hear yourself, right? 
As a full reboot in the Tomorrowverse, beware my power is fucking filled with violence, war and swearing. It opens with a literal PTSD attack from Jon Stewart, a Medal of Honor winning vet who fights for the undefended, until he's chosen and brought to the Justice League Watchtower. The previous owner of the ring is Hal Jordan, so Ollie goes to investigate what happened and they discover Oa is absolutely destroyed, everyone is dead, which at this point I should be f***ing desensitised to. But the mood here is actually genuinely effective. This film leans more towards cosmic horror, where it's tiny people trying to figure out the mystery and horror around them. It all feels lonely and maddening. I also just love how beautiful it all looks. The thick outlines, the choice in colour schemes, ooh the sound effects and spooky ambience with moments of sheer quiet drowning hollowness. As a result, out of the three it feels the most confident in the theatrical department and not just a fucking extended animated special which the others kind of felt a bit. The Rainians and the Thanagarians are at war after the Rainians Zeta beam their world next to theirs, causing mutual eco-collapse. Hot Girl gets pulled in and the little kid and me who fell in love with their romance is geeking out. Likewise, I'm sure. They find Adam Strange carrying over his DC showcase episode, and they find the Sinestro Corps. They get captured and imprisoned, but also find Hal Jordan, who reveals Sinestro is behind everything, and he sent the ring to deliberately save it. But actually, Hal is behind everything. He's actually Parallax, and he went Emerald Twilight on Oa. And John. Taking everything he learns, fights Hal, and then it's Ollie who has to kill his best friends. Very poetic. Adam Strange, who seems to have more screen time than John, sacrifices himself to stop the laser from hitting Thanagar, and John lets the rings off to go and rebuild the core. I hope to see you soon, John Stewart. Yeah. Ollie and John walk off, toasting absent friends and new ones, because in a lonely universe filled with war, chaos and confusion, the key is to look for the helpers, to not look for potential enemies, but to look for potential allies. I really enjoyed this one, just because it's f***ing weird, and also really provocative as a piece of moody sci-fi. Granted, it's more of an ensemble piece, with John's story as a loose thread, but he actually has to learn to use the ring and has an arc when it comes to dealing with his trauma by confronting it. <laughs> In the end, I really like these films. They all take very deeply diverse approaches to try and crack the code for adapting Green Lantern as a standalone film, and it's all through very different respectable ways in negotiating with having individual characters in tales where the world itself is almost a character on its own. First Flight is about making the hero the central charismatic entry point of the world. Emerald Knight is about democratizing its characters to have an even bigger world, crazier one. And Beware My Power is about discovering that world again once it's over and once it needs new life, new people. Yeah. So that was the Green Lantern animated movies video. Now if you don't mind, I'm gonna go and finish Cyberpunk Edge Runners and a more important show, Boys Over Flowers. <laughs> the first time you, you know. Older than both of you. 